jumped in uh, by um, uh, talking about a specific aspect of Carol um, in relation to Far From Heaven. Um, I, Far From Heaven is, uh, among many other things, a really intense dialogue with Douglas Sirk. Um, Carol was something very, very different. And I remember at the time when you were preparing Mildred Pierce, forgive me for the, <laughs> but when you, when you were um, thinking about research for Mildred Pierce, you were looking at, uh, I think, photographs of the era very specifically, and also work about the era that's depicted um, that was done later in the 70s, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it, it just, I just kind of want to start the ball rolling there by talking about maybe possibly a shift in the way that you're um, looking at uh, the work of a different era, because um, in Carol, one isn't thinking about references to films that's, that's not really present in the movie. It's something very different. Yeah. Um, I, I, did, I did look at a lot of films yeah. for Carol, but they, and I, and I started by, as I often do, by looking at films from the era that the story is set in. Yeah. But it, it it was very very quickly. I knew that it that wasn't particularly relevant to this, and I didn't wasn't interested in sort of repeating the the Serkian and you know um, studio system kind of filter on the on the style of the film. And I think also one of the very first ones I thought of when I read the adaptation, the first draft of the script and the um, novel was a brief encounter and I just started to think of great love stories on film and how and, and I thought oh wow this is something I haven't particularly approached as a discipline as a filmmaker and I always sort of want to give myself some kind of an assignment you know something that I feel like I can learn from and um, and it, it, it all started to make sense because um, well the novel the Price of Salt is entirely rooted in the point of view of Therese, the character that Rooney Mara plays in the film. And like most Patricia Highsmith novels that I've read, it, they're all locked inside a single mental state, even if they're written for a person. And this was no different, and drew very interesting parallels to that in tendency at first. But, I, but it just made me think about point of view it made me think about, because as soon as I read the first draft of Phyllis's script, it opened it up. And we all of a sudden had access to Carol freely um, that we didn't have in the book. And it made me, want, I just wanted to really um, be very conscious of how we enter Carol's, wor Carol's world initially, what that means, but that we, but trying to really structure the whole film around a uh, point of view. And that the great, the best love stories on film are rooted in the point of view of the more woundable, vulnerable party, the more amorous party. And in this case, that's mostly Therese through the story. But what's so interesting about the story, and this really isn't reflected in the, in the subjectivity of the novel, is that that changes in the course of the story. Yes. Yeah. And and so that great for people who know brief encounter, it begins in that um, refreshment stand in the train station, mm -hmm. and you're kind of so introduced to secondary characters in the story, and then in the background you see two people having a conversation. You're like, oh, that's Celia Johnson and mm -hmm. Trevor Howard, mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, they look like extras in their own yeah. film, yeah. and then a loudmouth gossip <laughs> friend says, Laura, and interrupts the conversation. You realize an important conversation has been interrupted. I'm going to be Marco Rubi Rubioing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope that's the last reference to Marco Rubio in our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but what's so interesting about that is immediately you're questioning whose story is this. Right. And you start to get deeper into her story, her point of view, her narration that she conveys to her husband when she goes back home, and this brief encounter, this which is ending that day, is retold 
in sort of real time in the film. And so, it's so, so I thought, oh wow, that's such a beautiful structuring device because then you travel th through the entirety of the, the narrative to explain what that conversation was about, what we missed. Right. And, and then it, you replay it at the end of the film, and of course we know the importance of it and what that interruption meant. But in Carol, by the time we come back, because I kind of lifted that right out of Grief Encounter and put it into our script. Um, by the time you come back to the hotel scene at the beginning of Carol, yes. they've, sh they've shifted their statuses in the relationship. And Therese, who was this young, uh, vulnerable, uh, you know, subject very much in formation before our eyes, mm -hmm who fell in love with Carol, Kate Blanchett, um, and was hurt, mm -hmm. and developed uh, defenses, and protections, mm -hmm. and limits, and has changed the way she looked, and has grown up. And all of a sudden, Carol has surrendered a lot, sacrificed a lot in her life, mm -hmm. reevaluated the meaning and the value of this very special girl that she met, mm -hmm. and has, is now coming back to, without spoiling the movie. <laughs> um, yeah, is, there, is there anybody here who hasn't seen the movie? Uh -oh. Ooh, yikes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of inevitable, I think, right, for an hour-long talk about. But, um, but it was about shifting points of view and about aligning yourself with the person who is more um, in, in peril, basically, mm -hmm. in love. But then it's finding, it's, it strikes me that it's, it's finding a common ground of common vulnerability, um, the, you know, coming back to it. Exactly. Yeah. And that love relationships do shift. Yeah. You know, and we, we, so we, we only, yeah. so we hear, yeah. and we don't, because we only remember when we're in peril. Yeah. And that's the part that's we right. remember. Yeah. We forget the other side. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, the, so it was really about love stories that, were rooted in this, this one of the subjects' yeah. uh, sides that, that, that I looked at a lot and, and gleaned from a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and then, yeah, I, I, um, I, I, you know, I think the visual language of the film was just you know, increasingly uh, informed by uh, the historical research that we were doing. Mm -hmm. And what New York City looked like in the early 1950s, how incredibly different a, a world it was than what we think of as the 50s, the Eisenhower 50s, right. which we fully um, explored in Far From Heaven. It's so funny how, how often, because I remember doing Far From Heaven and having, you know, the doing research of the period, Hartford, mm -hmm. Connecticut, 1957, and people saying, there's a great, there's a, lot, a big Italian population in Hartford when we're looking for extras. You might want to consider Italian looking extras. Or and I was like, no, we want everybody to look like patrician, Hollywood, backlot extras. <laughs> you know, nothing remotely connected to the real Hartford, Connecticut, 1957. But so many people would see Far From Heaven and go, I remember the 50s, it was exactly like that. Experience, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, wow, is it movies that yeah. change the way we think, yes. or yeah. is it yeah. something about the 50s and Eisenhower 50s in particular that does that? <clears throat> yeah, there's, a, there's a, 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 a piece by Manny Farber where he's talking about the, the, how the directors of the 70s were informed by growing up in the 50s, and he said, yeah, it was a great era, the big color was charcoal gray. <laughs> um, uh, and, and, and it's interesting, something that came up last night uh, in the discussion after the film, which is that the awareness that this is still the post-war era, yeah. and that the trauma um, and the cataclysm of war is carried yeah. um, in, to com in the people, in the way that they, yeah. that they move, and the way that they relate to one another. Yeah, it looks like a, it really looks like a, a post-war city, New York City. Mm -hmm. It looks distressed, it looks dirty. The, uh, also, the color process of color photography adds a unique kind of patina to the sort of soil palette um, or, where even the temperature is hard to determine. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a warm and cool kind of interplay, which is really interesting. But yeah, I mean, you know, we were still 
new, made to feel newly vulnerable by the arms race in Russia, and there's sort of lead in that incredible um, um, frustration with the Truman administration, a, a real need for a change in the administration. Uh, Eisenhower had been elected, but there was a much longer time before he took office right. back then than there is today. So it was in that, really in that interim that this story takes place. So there was a great deal of indeterminacy and insecurity mm -hmm. and uh, vulnerability. And that felt like a really poignant, um, gorgeous sort of terrain yes. to watch these little unexpected roots or, or sprouts of a, of a love emerge. Mm -hmm at this time, so, um, and also, with, as, as I mentioned last night, but I think it's really worth reiterating just how much, well, starting with Saul Leiter's photography, which yes. remained influential to me since I sort of discovered him so recently, because everyone, like Ed Lockman, had known about Saul Leiter forever, of course. Of course. Mark Friedberg, my designer on Mildred. Um, but so many of the so much of the photography, in addition to Saul Leiter's beautiful work, which features windows and reflections and sort of filtering of images that you'll see in Carol, um, there was also a great deal of beautiful color photography, and it's all uh, by women mm -hmm. photographers, photojournalists Esther uh, Bubbly, Ruth Orkin. Yes who was the partner of uh, Morris Engel, right. I mean, who Lolly made Pops and Little, and Fugitive, Little Fugitive, which is yeah. maybe the best known docudrama. And there was one that they did together called Lovers and Lollipops. Right, Lovers and Lollipops, that's it. That's yeah. more, set in, more set in locations that were relevant to Carol. Yeah. So we just kept watching it over and over. Mm -hmm. It was all shot in New York City. Mm -hmm. You, you also mentioned Helen Levitt. Helen Levitt. Um, who's oh, a great such artist. fantastic <laughs> work. And, and then Vivian Meyer, who has mm -hmm. been a more recent discovery, but whose work is amazing as well, and whose own, the way she would sort of indiscriminately capture her own reflection in, in her work mm -hmm. as a, as a um, documentarian of, of cities and uh, related to the role Therese plays in, in the story. She and Carol, in our version, is an aspiring photojournalist. In the novel, she was an aspiring uh, theater designer set designer. Yeah. It's it's interesting that you say this there's the seed of of love between the two of them and then it grows as the, you know uh, and flowers as the film moves but then it strikes me that it's complemented by also the seed of a kind of a bohemian culture that you're catching the edges of you know in the party um, it's it, it's just kind of kind of uh, finding its way. Yeah, I mean, we, we all know that culture existed much right. more thoroughly. In fact, it, it almost always seemed to have existed sure. in of course. New York. Yeah. There was the Bohemia, like in the, you know, I've read accounts, like the early 19th century accounts of like, oh yeah, those crazy yeah, people right. in Greenwich Village, you know. <laughs> and we always attribute it to the era right before we yeah, landed. That's right. um, yeah. <laughs> and, that's but. Uh, but I loved how in the uh, book, uh, Therese is, is a little m more, entra has a closer, there's a little more artistic aspirations yes. going on in both her ambitions and uh, her boyfriend Richard's. And Phyllis Naj's first draft had already removed that, and mm -hmm. I really liked that. I just thought it made these characters less equipped for the love that they were about to, for the experiences they were about to encounter. And um, and it just deepened this idea that, you know, what I, what I loved about the novel is that it describes love so much from that kind of tunnel that you're in when you're first falling in love. And you think no one's ever been there before you. And you are so impressed by the specificity of your desire, finding its exact object in this person. <laughs> and <laughs> this is it. Oh, I never have found that great, you know. And your life is a minefield of signs and things to be 
decoded mm -hmm. every gesture, every phone call, every little <laughs> pause in their breath means something <laughs> that's going to tell you whether you live or die, basically, you know. <laughs> and that is so fucking gorgeously conveyed by Patricia Heisman because it, it is like the criminal mind. It's exactly like <laughs> the criminal mind does in all of her other novels, mm -hmm. which is weaving these intricate webs of possibility. Yeah. Uh, you know, how you will get caught or not, how you'll avoid being found out, yeah. you know? So that was just brilliant, and, I, and, I, and so I think just making them less equipped for what they, those experiences made it all the more profound. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Todd uh, introduced last night's screening, we actually uh, dedicated it to Chantal Ackerman, and uh, I guess, I, I, you know, I'd always um, imagined that Chantal's work was very important to you, and uh, I gather that you knew her, and, and um, particularly in relation to Safe, I feel like there's a uh, there's an interesting relationship there. So I just sort of wanted to talk about that. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I, it's still so so. I think the weight of her, that loss is still um, being understood if it can be and um, and and really the, the, the maybe now the weight of of her amazing body of work and, um, and, and so much of it I haven't uh, caught up you know there's plenty of her films I haven't seen there's, she made a lot of films over the years but um, but yeah I mean I, I you know everyone probably who knows her work and has seen John Dealman and and what that first experience was watching that film. I don't know that my particular reaction is unique, but it was um, profound and really um, exhilarating and um, it's so inspiring, you know, for, uh, you know, the, as a filmmaker, as a, someone thinking about female subjects and how they're depicted and, and, and how and what we come to expect, um, you know, is occupied on screen when we tell the story of women's lives and what is important and what is not important. And, uh, and I just remember it was at, in college uh, that I was first exposed to her and we watched John Dealman and, and, you know, it's a long film but you, <clears throat> And you see the running time on your syllabus, and you're like, oh, God, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then this is it brown or at Bard? This is it brown. Mm -hmm. And you just fall into the, um, you know, the incantation, the, the unbelievable uh, spell of observing labor, of observing work in the kitchen, of observing routines of, that define her life. All the things that we've, you know, as people have said about the film many times, and there's been so much said about it that is normally <clears throat> removed from movies. This is what the center of this film is and the big events because she, she receives a, uh, has, you know, uh, sees uh, tricks, John's at the end of the day to supplement her income. And as soon as the doorbell rings, it cuts and we're back in the kitchen the next morning and watch the routines again. And when, <laughs> I'll just never forget when she's making the coffee and putting the same amount of cups in, but you're, you're slowly marking a um, uh, you know, de degradation, a, 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 a unraveling of this life. She puts one extra cup of water in the pot, I think it is, and everybody in the room went, <gasps> <laughs> and, and just the sheer power of understatement and, and negation of, of action. You know, and how much we make those events meaningful, you know, and how much when they are just slammed at us in traditional films, we're kind of numbed to, to what those things convey and signify. Anyway, it just, it's, I don't feel like I, there's much to, that, that, you have to just watch the film, I think, and that's the most, but certainly when it came to Safe, um, it was a seminal, film I couldn't not think about and uh, and I was also interested in um, 
setting up different kinds of obstacles to the way we normally uh, identify with central characters in movies and what uh, the viewer does uh, sort of uh, in recourse of that, uh, the, the sort of way you, the, the circuitous ways that you compensate and you, and you fill in yourself. Um, how hungry we are to um, participate in narrative experience and emotional experience. And so when there are, so it's really interesting to set up those obstacles, to pare down what we normally just throw out at, at, at spectators in films. And so with Carol, it was, a, it was this evacuation of a subject that was really the starting point for this person. And her relationship, absolutely, as you also feel in John Dillon, but in a very different way, to her environment and her domestic life. And um, at times, an almost oppressive um, uh, um, center position in the frame um, that, uh, that somehow she does not feel like she owns. That if anything, she feels dwarfed and minimized by. Um, but, uh, and, and again, as in Sean Dillon, a performance that, that, you know, astounds me still of Julianne Moore's in that film that, that um, made something absolutely um, recognizable and flesh and blood on the other end of this, these series of sort of interesting conceptual questions about, you know, who this woman is. I, I, unlike Sean Dillon, she's, uh... Carol in, in Safe is uh, not in control of the environment. She's pinned in the environment, right. which is something that you're just aware of at every given moment. And, right. You know how do it, it, it's as if you know she can she can't even uh, she ha she has no possibility of lateral movement in or out. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. She's she's utterly defined by the environment, and then yeah. the environment becomes this culprit that contaminates her, mm -hmm. and ultimately it it you know, destabilizes or undermines the question of an identity that already feels so conditional and right. sort of defined by the outside. Um, and, you know, it related to a lot of the sort of a long history of this. Uh, I, I loved the very, set when I first heard about environmental illness. Right. Um, and 20th century disease, it was also, the phrase was coined early on, and that it was only, it seemed to only affect housewives in their domestic, suburban lifestyle realms, and seemed to um, be caused by the chemicals and their products that they were surrounded by, and then the, you know, outgassing of the carpets and the upholstery in their homes. and. I just, you know, it just brought up a long and complicated history of women in illness and um, pathologizing women and um, and around their bodies and around their their environments and how they are domesticated in, in life. And the but the solution was removing them from these environments and putting sort of isolating them into these little these little. Um, Encampments, yes. um, these places of safety, where 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 Julianne Moore ends up in in safe. Um, but I was also really interested in the, the disease movie as a genre, right. and the way that it kind of reassigns identity, kind of strips you of the identity you're supposed to have. The illness it makes you completely and totally um, um, sort of have to question every marker of who you are, and then it reassigns you with a new sort of certitude that you are this cancer sufferer or you are this you know victim of, of um, environmental illness and it was at, at this time in 1994 when I was thinking or even earlier when I think I first started writing safe that we were still in the throes of the AIDS epidemic and whole notions of um, cause and culpability around HIV were, um, were in discussion. And, um, and I think just, uh, you know, a desire to make some sense of this 
virus that was, you know, frightening the hell out of the world, and how people get it, and what their responsibility was in getting infected. Mm -hmm. and, and I found, you know, that there was something really curious and, um, and uh, uh, just kept coming up again, resilient, recurrent, about the desire to blame yourself mm -hmm. when you are outside of situations that you can control. Mm -hmm. And so culpability became a means for controlling an uncontrollable situation. Right. And that's why in this can and so Louise Hay was a popular sort of, you know, um, you know, new age writer who basically was telling people with HIV, if you learned how to love yourself, you would overcome your AIDS. You know, and, and, it, and it gave people a sense of agency and control over the situation. But there was something heartbreaking about that. But I also felt like there's something so human about that and so universal about that. It's like the little kid who was like, you know, Mom, Dad, why are you getting a divorce? Is it because of me? Yeah. You know, we come to understand things by impl implicating ourselves at the center of them. Um, <clears throat> it strikes me that if, if one could say that there's a, um, a through line in your work, it's it's you're always looking at stories in which the terrain of power and scenarios of, of blame and self-recrimination um, are, are laid out and the characters are negotiating their way through them and looking for the, the, the escape hatch, um, which I would imagine is, is um, what led you to uh, has led, you know, has kept Rumbo as a touchstone for you, Janae, and then um, led you to make the, a movie about Bob Dylan, somebody who worked to you know, define himself um, and make himself. Yes. Um, I think for both in sort of, you know, um, with the assumption that, like, identity is this um, imposed uh, state right. that we are supposed to um, fulfill, yeah. In which invention supposedly plays no part. Exactly. Right. And, to be authentic. And, yeah. and change plays no part, or mutability, or instability, you know, or even, or artifice, construction. Uh, there's, we're supposed to find an authentic and organic self that is whole, you know, and we, we, we um, espouse those terms and, and elevate those, those ideas and those values. And so, maybe, in, at least in, of my feature films, the first uh, uh, terrain where I was trying to like look at kind of radically um, different strategies, um, practices around that was with the glam rock, um, the coal, coal, coal mine, yeah. and how weirdly um, rebellious and and disquieting it, 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 that moment was, that sort of bisexual androgynous uh, rally, rallying cry in the early 1970s that yeah. affected certainly the UK and a lot of some of Western Europe, but also America as well, yeah. and, and was inspired by a lot of what was happening as a sort of reaction to the 60s hippie ethics yes. ethos um, that a lot of the Brits, like David Bowie, um, was inspired by in, in the Stooges and and Brian uh, Eno and his glam rock years. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Built, built it underground. Um, but that that notion of instability, radical instability in terms of sexual orientation and sexual identity, um, you know, is still uncomfortable today in our in our very advanced state of progress around um, issues of. Um, acceptance around gay, lesbian, uh, bisexual, transgender issues because it's so much easier and so much more legislatively tidy to talk about sexual orientation as something that we're born into mm -hmm. that's biologically determined and stable. And then you can just say, no, there's no question, there's no choice mm -hmm. involved. Mm -hmm. Choice is this 
you know, or freedom discomfort. to change. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. or election, like right. a desire to actually change it up. Yep. Um, and what so was so interesting about the glam moment was that it was also addressing the the inherent instability of adolescents because it's aimed at young people mm-hmm. and how much they don't know who they are from day to day. Yeah. And that fantasy or that um, metaphor of, of a alien space androgynous straight space creature who was a bisexual, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. was so liberating and so radical. I think in so many ways, and 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 continues to be today. Interestingly, mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. But Dylan was just another example in a very American um, version of somebody who was. Um, and I, and I, you know, when I first got into Dylan in high school, I don't know that I necessarily saw him that way as some, as a, as a shapeshifter. Yeah. It was sort of um, at coming back to him later in my life, and at a time I, weirdly, symptomatically, maybe needed something from him again. Um, that right. I got in deeper. Yeah, he was like an established. You figure you and I are roughly the same age, and so he, when yeah. he was exploding, we were little kids. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And and so. you know he always sort of connoted you know that um, cocksurety yeah. and that kind of like yeah. you know um, which which is tr- true. I mean mm-hmm. that part is is true. That engine of sort of like defiance and stuff. But it but how much it really was changing. How much it was. I mean we all. I guess I never, you know, didn't necessarily identify the plugging in electric, yeah. and and seeing that on a similar um, continuum mm-hmm. or pattern, creative <laughs> act or something, yeah. uh, as the becoming Christian. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Like when that happened, we were like, Ooh, yeah. I'm just not going to think about that for a while. <laughs> yeah, it's just too weird. Um, but when you really look at you know, the whole of it. It was real. It's like, no, no, this is, this makes so much sense. Yes. And yeah. so anyway, I just, that, that was a, uh, but, but yeah, it was a, a way of, um, it was a way of throwing up or throwing back at the social <laughs> expectations of a kind of uh, constancy. Um, this person who was not going to do it the same way each time. Yeah. And even today, when he tours, he does all the songs, but you're like, oh, that was all on the Watchtower. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like completely redone in a way. Yeah. You're like, whoa, okay. Yes. <laughs> Get into that now, you know. Um, but, but, but really, to be, uh, fundamentally, I think it's ultimately, it's just that he's this, you know, ten, a creative entity who, who has to sort of be making things to survive life, you know. Yeah. And that, but under the pressure of what he became at that time in in, in New York and or wherever he was in the in the sixties in particular, the demand to keep fulfilling um, social expectations right. was too constraining, and he had to lash out against that. And there was a mm-hmm. kind of hostility, you know, a kind of healthy maybe creative hostility in, in that practice. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's the moment in his autobiography when. Uh, I, I guess Joan Baez or Robbie Robertson said to him, this is the moment when you're going to take it all the way home. You're going to take it to the top. You're the prophet. You know, or something like that. And he's like, okay, yeah. time for me to withdraw. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Bad word. Don't yeah. use that word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if uh, I'd like to open it up for questions for anyone. Yeah, it's Jim. Um. Microphone's on its way. Oh, your beautiful Carol film. I want to ask two questions about it, Todd. Um, one is a technical one. Ed Lockman spoke a couple of days ago about the use of 16 and what that privileges the cinematographer. And, and, and I'd like you to talk about that from a director's point of view and the relationship with the production design. The second question has to do with sapphic desire, 50 sexuality, and privilege and how you play with those themes in that beautiful script that was written, how it's played. 
Uh, your first question, Jim, it was it was how the uh, the use of sixteen privilege. Yes. No. No. How what sixteen? Why you choose to shoot in sixteen? And what that and what that gives you that is not available in digital, even right. though it's a digital. There's an aspect to it. Right. We finished digital. In digital. Yeah. yeah. The output, unfortunately, is digital. Although Ed and I went in on a print together. Ooh. <gasps> Where's that? Print parallel. <laughs> in an undisclosed <laughs> location. <laughs> the Cheney compound. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, we. It was really, you know, it was when we were doing Mildred Pierce that I think it was just simply. I mean, it was very much about the decade of the uh, Depression era, the 1930s. That that whole miniseries, and uh, we knew it was going to be tel broadcast on on HP on TV. It was made made as a long form dramatic thing, and uh, just having seen stuff shot on 35 and blown up to HDTV, it looks like digital because of the sophistication of lenses and, and stocks these days are so fast, so fine-grained, that you just lose the grain uh, element. So we that was really, it was a, it was like, no, we want to see the grain and have it be a movie on, you know, everybody who did Mildred uh, came from film, including Kate Winslet, she'd never done anything for TV before, so we were all, you know, proud of that. <laughs> that we didn't know anything about TV yet. Uh, and wanted it to look like a movie, and, you know. Um, and so we and so we did, and the results were really great, and and um, and it was fun to downgrade to a small 16 millimeter camera. I thought I thought that was kind of radical, you know. Um, and uh, but but the look was so. Meant, meant so much, and I think some of the visual references, although we were looking at uh, this, this sort of parallel moment that I was conjuring in the 70s, um, new naturalism, American filmmaking of the 1970s, it was going back to traditional genre filmmaking, but imbuing it with a sense of freshness, a new kind of visual sensibility, a new kind of you know, actors and stuff, but still being very true to the forms and conventions of those generic traditions, the noir and the thriller and the horror film and all of those things. Um, and we wanted to bring, and, and, but make, making those films feel sort of socially relevant to the 70s, uh, while still being sort of classical about, about their love of these source, sources. And that's what we kind of wanted to bring to Mildred. Um, and in this case, we, we really weren't looking at 70s films. We were looking more at m stuff from the, from the early 50s. Um, in the case sapphic of love and the 50s. And, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> sapphic desire as opposed to homosexual desire because right. you've done films on both, yes. period. Yes. And, and, and power or privilege or class, whatever yes. work, word yeah. works yeah. there. Well, you know, uh, this class class difference, class plays a real role in, in Carol, as it did in Melbourne, actually. Um, and, and really, so much of the tensions and the complexities have almost as much to do with the age difference and the class difference and the different power, uh, the status of power that Carol assumes over Therese in the story as the fact that there are two women, or at least they all, you know, combine to create a very specific dilemma for um, subjects. And, um, but yeah, and, and a lot of it is about um, aspirations about becoming a woman, I think, and how, what, you know, because Carol represents femininity to Therese in very specific Ways that almost ways that you almost feel she hadn't fully um, confronted, um, and definitely hadn't confronted the um, incredible sort of sway and uh, over her um, until she saw Carol. Um, but every the way every aspect of Carol's person is cataloged in the in the in the book is noteworthy and 
and made an impression and something we wanted to bring to the textures and the, the, the feel and the surveying of, of Carol's world. Um, but in many ways, Carol also is straightjacketed in that world, and so obviously. It's, it's a world that she's, she's done everything to fulfill and become this ideal sort of wife and, and partner for Harge, her husband. And it has not fulfilled her. And there's some, something, there's something really missing in, in that. And something missing that even Abby, the character yeah. that Sarah Paulson plays, who has a prior history, a long history with Carol, we learn, hasn't been able to fulfill. And we, we um, uh, assume that we know that Abby comes from that class, yeah. that, that uh, more privileged class that, that Carol enters. Um, and so it, there's something beyond it that Carol needs as well. But I did, I have to say, I, I thought it was just fun to make a film about uh, women falling in love and an older and younger woman where the older woman is the object of desire. And the younger woman is, is enthralled by the beauty and the allure of the older woman. Um, I just want to say that while you um, you were talking, I just want to. Uh, it's it's easy to overlook the refinement and beauty of Kyle, Kyle Chandler's performance as Harge. He's spectacular. Yeah. That guy is so gifted. He's a great actor. I, he is such a great actor, and he's made for the '50s too. Yeah. So as soon as he got into those clothes, I was like, oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> Harge. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, microphone's coming. Here it comes. I know that um, Douglas Sirk was not always regarded highly, um, particularly whenever his films were being released in the 50s. Um, and I think there had been sort of a bit of a critical reevaluation before Far From Heaven. Um, but I'm just curious if there are any other filmmakers, either contemporary or a little bit older, who you think are due for a sort of similar, um, similar um, reevaluation, either by critics or by filmmakers. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, oh I'm going to think of it as soon as I leave here. I'm going to be like, ah, that's what I should have talked about. No one's coming to mind. And certainly no one of this, of, I think, of the importance of, of Cirque and melodrama and the way melodrama in general has been denigrated, you know, as a, as a genre alongside the, all the other genres that are more often associated with male subjects and but you know there's something really um, uh, there's something you know beautiful and fascinating and, and radical and go gorgeously constructed about these certain films but they also and Fassbender is the first person to talk about this although he was so changed radically changed and, and redirected when he first encountered the certain films in the early 70s is that they they leave you with a, a sense of dissatisfaction. There's some, because you're, you're watching, and Cirque will say this too, he's like, you can't make films about things. You can only make films with things, with people, with light, with mirrors, with flowers. Basically he's saying, I think, that you, all I can do is show you the conditions that we all live under. And then you, and I'm, and I'm not gonna show your, you these characters figuring their way out of them or overcoming them. That's what you have to go home with. And that means, and Foster talks about the way the camera is always observing. Uh, it's not about subjectivity. It's about the emotion you feel is due to you know, montage and music. It's not due to uh, being uh, identification with the character. You're outside, you're watching Jane Wyman, watching, you know, Rock Hudson, and desiring him, but not being able to go there for all of these other things that you're watching. And so they don't stroke you. They don't um, um, solve problems for you. And that makes them uh, maybe less, you know, purely satisfying. Can I actually throw out a couple of 
Technicolor melodramas of the same era that are also known, but maybe in need of a little bit more attention than Strangers When We Meet. Oh, yeah. I'm sure you know. It's such a and, beautiful. I looked at that for um, Carol. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and also, these, after Delmer Davis had his heart attack on The Hanging Tree, he made these movies with Troy Donahue, mm. Susan Slade, and Parrish. And, I don't, I don't know kind of, those. Oh, yeah. those are pretty cool movies. Okay, wow, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Troy Donahue aside. <laughs> Yeah, let's go to this side, yeah. Wait for the microphone. There is a lot of visual beauty in Carol, and you know, I thought a big part of it was costumes, and especially Therese, I thought, had a journey um, evolving into a more feminine look, so I was wondering if you could talk about how involved were you working with Sandy Powell, capturing those looks and what that meant for the characters. Yes. Um, it's a really, it's, uh, it's a deeper, more formative process for actors than people often, know, I think, may, may know. And maybe this is more true for period films too, where even the, the girdles and the underpinnings and the stockings and the heels um, affect the way you move and the way your body feels, you know, in space and the way um, what's the gestures that become possible uh, within within those constraints, and so they they help to inform the process of, of the act the actor's process of finding the the characters and the sort of material uh, specificity of their role, um, and so they're intensely important to to um, the actors work and and they they speak about it way more you know um, articulately and beautifully than I, than I do but I but I observe that and I know I mean it, all that stuff matters a great deal to me and I'm very interested in it and the silhouettes that were available the new look of the 50s versus the I guess more Chanel silhouette you know these were um, aesthetic choices and and choices of, of shape that that Sandy and I talked about a lot, and that's stuff that I, I would be looking at from the outside. Um, and so they had a meaning, and, and uh, but, but yeah, that whole process. And so it, it, it's really just a process where Sandy begins with actors. It's, you know, also we, we, used, we, we didn't have a huge budget on Carol. Sandy would far prefer being able to afford to build most of the clothes in a film that the, principles where that we had money for and, and and but that just meant that we had to look at vintage clothes and you start with vintage clothes anyway which they try on for shape we take a lot of pictures we talk we exchange ideas the actors move around in them and then we start to narrow down and then and then in this case it was like okay which which are the really important clothes that Carol wears that we have to make which are the vintage clothes that really work that we can make that Carol can wear, but definitely that Therese can wear, because she's still sort of finding herself and finding her identity through her um, her look and her. I think you know there's a reference in the film to the fact that she's a photographer, but she's uncomfortable taking pictures of people, and then she, she starts to take pictures of Carol, and in a way the very act of being able, and then you start to see that she can start taking pictures of people in general. And I think in a way it's a way for her to start seeing herself in the world as a subject and how she looks and how she participates in life. Um, so that's all part of it, you know, and I think the clothes play a sort of foundational role in that process. And then shaping her own appearance, changing her and then and Exactly, and then really growing up. It's almost like hostile because when she no longer is available to Carol or so she thinks and this has to move on is when she most resembles her. Um, yeah, my question is about the casting of the film. Mike's coming. Uh, yeah, my question is about the casting of the film. Uh, did you always have Kate Blanchett and Rooney Mara in mind? And what qualities do those actresses possess that you thought made them Perfect choices for the roles. Kate Blanchett was attached to the film. Exactly. Kate was on before I was. Um, 
So that was sort of a drag. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, as a director, you make do, and you, you just want to the material. But I picked Rooney, <laughs> I'm so happy to say. And, um, and uh, I, I just I just had watched her like I'm sure most of you guys have you know in in all the in the films that she's done and and um, and in such a you know short amount of time she's distinguished herself um, so totally as such a serious and thoughtful and gifted um, actor and um, and really I think it's that I just think like when you see a young actor like that. Who knows? Who knows? Somehow understands the scale of the medium, of film, so well that she knows how to underplay, how to reduce down and minimize the gesture, and have it almost have more impact mm -hmm. through understatement. You know that to me is like rare and and speaks to real like intelligence and, and innate. And understanding that exceeds her years and her experience, and you see that in this performance. I think maybe more than anything, yeah. um, she's done because it kind of asks for it more, you know. And um, that was just a real, yeah. That that was, you know. Of course, they they they. I thought they would work well together, but that's always sort of a. You just hope that that is true. And the husband? The husband? The casting of the husband. Oh, yeah. Uh, Kyle, well, I, you know, he's, I know, I've, I haven't seen all of Friday Night Lights, but I've seen enough of them to just be so impressed by his, his work. Um, also, about Rooney and about Kyle, is I talked to people who'd worked with them and, um, you know, just heard fantastic things. And that also helps the process of deciding. Um, but but with you know uh, you you have to cast a real uh, without sounding sexist a real man yeah. opposite Kate Blanchett. <laughs> you need a guy who's grown up, you know, and a lot of actors just don't seem grown up no matter how old they get. They just seem like <laughs> juveniles with gray hair or something. <laughs> and he is like a, you know he's like a he seems like a grown up. And um, he could hold his own with her. And um, yeah, that's not always easy. There was actually a very funny moment last night during the, the Q&A when someone asked you, how did you come to choose Kate Blanchett for your role of Carolyn Yusuf? Well, I didn't. She, was, um, she came uh, before him. And she said, yeah, but how did you come to choose her? <laughs> she just wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, it didn't quite, yeah. <laughs> Did she choose you? Uh, I have a question basically about movies. Uh, audiences come to movies, movie houses, to distance themselves from their problems and rather engage in the problem of the plot, the characters, etc., that they see. Uh, was this movie Carol? Something about uh, like brief encounter uh, that you uh, based it on, or is this something entirely uh, uh, different? Uh, uh, I, I, I seem to think when you started talking about it, it sounded like brief encounter uh, in a in a railway station where they had a conversation <laughs> and somebody interrupted. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's just, it seems to me that this is a question that relates directly to melodrama and, and, and involvement with the uh, characters. Right. Yeah. The people themselves uh, probably had their own problems, health-wise, etc., et uh, for their uh, their relationship with their uh, husbands, uh, which in. Uh, had an influence in their uh, relationship with somebody they just met. Uh, and, 
uh, this was what I thought was uh, the plot that we were talking about. Well, Brief Encounter was a influence in how um, I, I, I worked with Phyllis, the writer. We did some structural changes to the, to the shape of the story, the narrative. But really, the, what was similar about the two, uh, for me, is they're, they're, they're really just about, yeah, they're, they're about, um, they're very simple stories, really. They're really about love um, cropping up unexpectedly in life, almost as a, as a uh, problem, uh, almost as a, uh, uh, something you don't ask for. A conflict, that, in other words. Yeah. Exactly. That messes everything up and makes you have to rethink everything when you didn't think you were really up for that. And it affects all the members of the family. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yes. So we'll do one more. Yeah, right over here. How did you decide to do the film about this topic? And uh, before doing it, how did you think it would be unique from other films about this topic? Um... I, I'm not sure I was necessarily driven by trying to make it um, unique, it, or, or at least, um, except for the issues and the setting and the fact that it was about uh, love between two women, which I'd never explored in my films before. It was really a tribute to the lesbian people in my life, my <laughs> dear friends, who are seminal in my life, and um, who are like, you never read The Price of Salt? <laughs> like, no. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but, but I, um, because I think, you know, I, I, I think it's what happened with Brokeback Mountain when it came out. It's like, Love stories always need um, um, obstacles between the lovers, things that keep the lovers apart. Um, and increasingly, as we move forward in life progressively, at least maybe even more so in the West than other parts of the world, that becomes harder and harder to imagine why two people couldn't get together. And that's what made, I think, Brokeback Mountain imbued the genre with a new, fresh... Uh, sense of, um, you know, just like, wow, this really works uh, as a love story because it's in the most unexpected place and the most unexpected kind of love. And I think Carol has that in it. I think that's part of uh, what made it unique. But I, but I also felt like I, 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 you know, I like learning from things that, have, uh, that, that, that are out there, that have been done before beautifully. 